Okay, welcome back to this course on polymer chemistry and this will be the last lecture for this course. What we will do in this lecture, we will cover basically complete our discussion which we are having on chemistry on polymer additives and we will talk about fire retardants, surface active additives and reinforcing failures today and then briefly talk about uh, polymer blends and then go to the concluding remarks uh, about this course. Let us talk about fire retardant and we had earlier about 2, 3 lectures earlier we discussed the fire retardant and uh, the evaluation techniques and you know, how do you measure the fire retardant properties of a polymer sample for example, that limited oxygen index we talked about uh, uh, one of the ways to measure the fire retardant properties. The other measure other method we talked about that UL method where we burn the sample from a particular distance and the under particular condition and in presence of some ignitable materials like cotton and then we uh, range or rank those polymer species uh, depending upon how long they burn and how they burn and whether they ignite that cotton which is present below uh, the sample. One of the also important thing that uh, about uh, fire tendency is that whether uh, the polymer during the burning whether they are generating smoke and toxic gases. So, basically a good fire retardant polymer should not generate lots of smoke and, uh, and obviously, they should not produce toxic gases. So, fire retardants are chemicals which are used to retard the ignition and burning of plastics by interfering with the chemistry and or the physics of the combustion process. Fire retardant additives enable plastics to meet various fire safety and performance standards imposed upon them. You know the application of pl plastics uh, in various uh, common public uh, purpose like say in airplane or in building materials. Now, in those applications this uh, fire retardancy is, is a very important important criteria for uh, regulatory criteria for um, the polymers to be used in those applications. Because for example, if you talk about a building construction material where the polymer used must be a fire retardant it should not catch or ignite fire easily or if in case uh, unfortunately it is getting ignited it should not produce toxic gas or uh, smoke. Uh, so, basically this uh, property is required for the applications where uh, it is essential for the polymer to be fire retardant. Now, to design a fire retardant additives, we need to consider the polymer ignitability, the rate of flame spreading, rate of heat release and formation of smoke and toxic gases as we mentioned before. One thing uh, one must note that there is no uniform for additives, it is not that one FR additive is best for all the polymers. So, it is basically the choice of fire additives depend upon the pair of the polymer and the additives. Basically, one additive may be very good for one polymer, but the same additive may not be as good as for the other polymers. So, it is, uh, uh, it is essential that uh, the combination is uh, chosen rightly. 
So, no universal FR additives the performance varies with the final form of product and generally highly aromatic polymers and the halogen containing polymers are inherently better fire retardant. How the fire retardants work and they basically prevent this ignition or combustion process by whatever means or some means. For example, they can release the or they can absorb the heat released during the com combustion process by releasing water from them. They can form a insulating char on the combustion substrate and thus by stopping or preventing supply of further fuel to the fire. So, it basically it stops the fire and the fire comes down. It can also interfere, you can design additives which interfere with the chemical reactions that maintain the fire. Now, to maintain the fire there are they presume that some chemical reactions are happening which are basically radical processes which maintain and space fire. Now, if we can stop those chemical reaction then basically we can stop the spreading of the flame. Example, so this was the uh, basis uh, of choosing or designing fire retardants. We now, we talk about few additives which work by one of these mechanism for example, titania alumina and trihydrate they when uh, in, in a fire situation it releases water around 200 degree centigrade which basically inhibits the combustion process. So, that is one example of uh, a fire additive one which basically act as uh, fire retardant additives by absorbing heat uh, by releasing water. Second mechanism by which uh, some of the additives may function is by forming insulating char on the substrate as we just discussed in a minute. And some examples are phosphorus uh, flame retardants, phosphate ester, PVC and these are used mainly for PVC polyurethane polypropylene oxide type polymer. Uh, look at these are mainly inorganic material because inorganic, inorganic materials they do not uh, basically burn in those temperature typically organic you cannot um, use organic material for char form for making insulin char because organic material themselves burn off. So, mainly phosphorus containing flame retardant act uh, as a flame retardant by forming insulating char. The other flame mechanism by which uh, fire retardant works is by interfering with the chemical reactions that maintain the fire and promotes the spread of the fire. And for example, this halogenated or brominated uh, aromatics they uh, emits uh, hydrogen bromide during um, decomposition and the other halogenated compounds work in that way. They basically uh, trap the radicals which uh, it is uh, basically assumed or presumed that the radicals which basically spread the fire. So, this HBr or a HX halogenated uh, hydrogen halides basically trap those uh, radicals and prevent those chemical reactions which spread fire and they are mainly used for polymers like nylon, polyester, styrenix and polyolefins. A combination of uh, halogenated F1 and antimony trioxides also used uh, some cases and it is uh, the way it is work uh, that uh, on combustion at a temperature at uh, 600 degree Fahrenheit these halogens form hydrochloride or hydrobromic acids that reacts with the antimony oxides to form antimony halide or antimony 
oxyhalides which basically traps those free radicals and prevent that uh, chemical reactions which basically produces uh, uh, basically it, it stops or prevents this uh, thermo oxidation processes which we generates uh, this volatile or uh, flammable volatile flammable uh, organic compounds and if they prevents formation of those uh, flammable organic compounds volatile flammable organic compounds they basically prevent the burning process. So, this is the me mechanism by which uh, halogenated FR along with antimony trioxides uh, synergy works. So, we are now we will talk about next set of additives which are surface active agents or surface active additives. Now, these additives actually work on different interfaces for example, polymer air interface or polymer mold interface or interface between two polymeric phases in a blend for example. Now, there are plenty of example of such surface active additives. What I am going to do in this uh, next few minutes is give examples of or give uh, generic examples how of these additives how they work and give few examples of such additives. Now, let us first talk about uh, polymer additives which work in polymer air interface. First, let us talk about additives anti fog or anti fogging agents. Now, if you think about a polymer wrap, a transparent polymer wrap which are used in a grocery stores which are used for wrapping this fruits or food materials and they are kept in a refrigerator and a freezer. Now, if in normal situation what will happen the water droplet will condense in that flame and it will hinder your visibility somebody else's visibility through that flame because of fog formation and customer will not able to look at the food material which is inside the wrapper. So, he or she may not buy that material. So, anti fogging agents basically a surface active agent which migrate to this polymer surface and being hydrophilic in nature it makes the polymer surface quite hydrophilic and in a hydrophilic surface the water droplets cannot condense into beads. When they come in the water vapor come in contact with this surface they actually form a thin flame of water which does not interfere with the light such a way that it, it basically gives any reduction in the visibility through this plastic material or it does not decrease the transparency of this plastic material. Similar type of additives is anti-stat additive or anti-static additive where additives which migrate to the surface and being water absorbing it can absorb water from the atmosphere and form a layer of water molecules which form pathways for dissipating the static charges. So, if there are antistatic additives were not used during the normal usage of the plastic material the static can static charge can generate on the surface which 
might give lot of hazard to the user, but if antistatic additives surface active antistatic additives are used then what happened the agent surface active agent might get to the surface and they absorb water which form channels through which the static charge can dissipate it. So, there is no formation of static charge. Easy clean or self clinic type additives which are basically very hydrophobic additives which on migrating to the surface make the polymer surface very hydrophobic such a way such extent that when water droplet condense on it, it cannot hold on to the surface it basically rolls off because the contact angle between the water and the polymeric surface is very high. So, it basically rolls off and during this rolling off process it can take away the dirt or the impurities which are present in the surface. So, basically this type of made these additives make the surface self clinic. So, or easy cleaning it is the cleaning of the surface is uh, done easily. Next set of additives are basically used to make the polymer surface uh, useful for biological applications. There are lots of applications where polymers or parts of parts made of polymeric uh, uh, polymeric polymers are used in biological application. In those cases the polymer surface comes in contact with biological fluid. Now, the surface of the polymer should be such that it should not interfere the normal biological processes or it should not basically introduce uh, or uh, start the coagulation process in the biological fluids. For example, when a patient goes through a uh, open heart surgery, the blood of the patient's body is taken out and by help of external machine called oxygenator which act basically as lungs and heart. So, it basically purifies the blood and also pump into the body. So, this oxygenator is mostly made up of polymeric materials and the membranes by which this purification is done is also made up of polymeric material. Now, there are so many other examples I can give where um, polymers are used for medical applications where they are in contact with the uh, biological fluids may be blood or serum or or tissues or on and so on. So, the polymers must be uh, biocompatible and hemocompatible if it is contact with uh, real blood uh, anti thrombogenic because it should not uh, start the uh, coagulation process. Now, if we look at the uh, steps or processes what happened when a polymeric surface or any for the matter of fact any other external surface come in come in contact with biological fluid. The first step what happened proteins present in the biofluid they get adsorbed on the external surface and subsequently there are lots of other steps which happens following that adsorption process. Now, if we can make the polymer surface such that this absorption of protein um, can be prevented or minimized, then we can make uh, this polymer surface hemocompatible or anti thrombogenic, whatever we call that or anti fouling to protein whatever name we can give. And that is done typically by using uh, making the polymer very hydrophilic or grafting or modifying uh, the surface using surface active additives uh, uh, surface active additives make the surface uh, rich with hydrophilic polymer. So, that uh, the protein coming proteins is uh, uh, 
prevented from adsorbing on the surface sterically and one of the examples of the polymer used for surface modification is polyethylene glycol very often. So, these are the some examples uh, where surface active additives are used uh, uh, for, for medical applications modifying polymer surfaces uh, that are utilized for medical applications. One another example is antimicrobial where basically um, there are some devices uh, uh, which are used by many people like a computer mouse of a time using, using it may have been used by somebody else. So, so if uh, this is uh, this uh, mouse is made up of uh, anti the surface is antimicrobial uh, uh, additives made up of uh, antimicrobial additives then it prevents uh, formation of microbes uh, on the surface of the polymers and that actually prevent uh, spreading of microbes uh, uh, between among people. And typically uh, surface active agents are used for this purpose. There are other uh, surface active agents are used basically to improve the mechanical property of uh, polymer surfaces like scratch, scratch resistance, improved wear performance and so on and then some other uh, specific examples like anti glare, anti piracy these are the some examples where surface active agents are used. Now, to be successful uh, as a surface active additives, uh, the additives must have some attributes. Uh, for example, it must be partially compatible. If it is completely compatible with the polymer matrix, then it will be soluble on uh, soluble in the polymer matrix. So, it will not come out uh, to the surface and if it is completely incompatible then it will bloom out of the surface. So, there is nothing will really be in. So, the additives in this case must be partially compatible so that um, it migrate to the surface, but be in the uh, polymer matrix. Second, it should have low surface energy component so that it migrates during processing during processing technique or molding processes it migrates to the surface to minimize the surface energy. At least part of the surface uh, part of the additives must have a low surface energy component. It must be thermally stable so that it can survive the processing condition and it should be chemically unreactive to the, the pol base polymer it is being used. So, basically these are the attributes a surface active additives must have to be successful in any application. The some other application which uh, work uh, other type of surface like polymer mold surfaces uh, to improve the mold release property of the mold uh, of the polymer material polymer material mold release are added mold release basically uh, the a, a, a polymeric uh, surface active agents which have long hydrophobic tail and because of presence of this high surface low surface energy long hydrophobic tail they migrate to the surface and as a result they form a lubricating layer on the molds on the polymer surface. So, they can be easily released from the polymer mold. The other examples of surface active agents which are used for dispersing a solid filler in polymer matrices. So, that the if you use external fillers particulate fillers uh, to disperse them well in a polymer matrices some surface active agents are used which are basically cover or sit in the interface between the filler and the polymer matrices and thus helps the dispersion of that particulate fillers. Compatibilizers they are like uh, block copolymer type um, surface active agents which, uh, which go and occupy the interfaces between two polymer phases to reduce the interfacial energy between the two polymer phases 
and act as a compatibilizer. Some example or few example of surface active additives. Now, like these, these additives or the other additives we talked about, they could be small organic molecules or inorganic molecules, or they could be oligomeric or polymeric additives as well. For example, this PTAP polytetrafluoroethylene are added to the polymer to improve uh, the wear resistant or coefficient of friction because of the low surface energy it migrates to the surface during processing and the coefficient of friction of this fluorinated polymers are very very low so they form a lubricating layer on on the base polymer surface and improve the wear resistance these are the examples of few mold release agents as i said they have a long tail hydrophobic tail and because of this they may get to the surface and and form a lubricating layer and um, which helps release of the article polymer article from the mold examples of uh, improving hemocompatibility or biocompatibility of polymeric surface is uh, like tegomar which is a block copolymer of polycaprolactone and pdms because of presence of pdms it might get to the surface and because of hydrophilic nature of polycaprolactone it basically form a domains of hydrophilic and hydrophobic regions which actually help in being the surface uh, biocompatible or hemocompatible. Let us move to the next set of uh, additives which are fillers which are mainly used to reinforce uh, the polymer performance mainly uh, benefiting the mechanical properties of the base polymers and many types of fillers. Uh, mainly inorganic uh, are added to polymers for different purposes and some of them are listed here. And inorganic fillers they themselves have uh, high modulus. So, these uh, by adding these inorganic fillers uh, at least it increases the modulus of the base polymer. And some of the newer fillers uh, which are nowadays used in polymer uh, matrices or polymer formulations are nano fillers and when they are added these nano fillers are added to the polymer formulations the resulting formulation or resulting polymers are called nano composites. Some nano materials which are used as a filler are nanoparticles. They are particles having diameter between 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer range. It could be silica, silica partic particle, titanium dioxide and uh, conducting particles and so on. There are many examples of such nanoparticles. Nano wires or nano fibers, where it is basically whisker of filaments with diameters in the range of 100 to 10 to 100 nanometer, having high aspect ratio. Nano tubes, especially carbon nano tubes, because of their very highly uh, high, high um, potential. This single wall carbon nanotube or multi wall carbon nanotubes are nowadays uh, used uh, uh, for different uh, polymeric nano composites. Nano clays they are layer 2 dimensional structure and having thickness in nano dimension. They are also used for um, in nano composites and other um, fullerene, spherical fullerenes, and others also used as a nano fillers. Now, what it does uh, to the base polymer the nano fillers actually improve the 
some of the properties of the base polymers uh, like strength, modulus, uh, toughness, heat distortion temperature, UV resistance, barrier properties. We gave the example of nano clay uh, during the uh, discussion of barrier properties. It basically increases the torturous, uh, torturosity or increases the path to be covered by a gas to, to come out of the polymer uh, mat thickness. It also increases thermal and uh, electrical conductivity if they are used in proper amount and their dispersion is proper. Obviously, they also bring some uh, challenges for example, uh, with this uh, inorganic fillers the transparency of the base polymers is uh, basically come down and that is because as we discussed earlier uh, difference in the refractive, refractive index between these fillers and the polymer matrix and if the size is uh, large then it can cause lot of scattering. The ductility also come down along with increasing in the modulus by these nano fillers and thermal stability. Uh, may be sometimes also questionable because uh, uh, this might bring some impurities along with these fillers. So, that might cause some uh, questions about the thermal stability of this polymer especially at the high temperature or in during the processing condition. One example is shown here, this is a monmontorite uh, clays which is very commonly used nano clay and uh, they having layered uh, two dimensional structure. And so, ideally to get the best property from the clay as a filler they has uh, to be dispersed quite well. So, this has their layer has to be dismantled and dispersed like the what is shown here and we call this as exfoliated nano composite and that happens there is if there is a, a, this the very good interaction between the polymer matrices and the surface of this clay. There could be intermediate uh, scenario between these two where the layers are uh, separated to some extent with the polymer chains in between and we call this as a intercalated nano composite. Obviously, to improve property one uh, this type of exfoliated uh, nano composite uh, with nano clays are always preferred. So, with, in, with uh, use of this uh, nano clay uh, the base polymer there is improvement in modular strain sites and barrier and fire retardant property, but obviously with this the transparency come down and ductility of the matrix comes down. Okay, with, with this let us uh, we basically come to our discussion on polymer additives and there are other additives can be discussed, but uh, due to lack of uh, time we cannot discuss uh, the entire list of additives used for polymeric material. What I did I did uh, discuss the important additives which are very commonly used in polymer industries. Now, briefly talk about polymer blends. Polymer blends is basically mixture of uh, more than one homopolymers or copolymers. Now, to bring why they where do you require to bring uh, or mix uh, two polymers. Sometimes what happened one polymer is not sufficient enough to meet all the stringent requirement of properties uh, for a product. So, sometimes by using another um, polymer mixed with another polymer 
the properties is uh, met. So, we discuss let us define a few terms related to polymer blends. Uh, polymer blends as we know is a mixture of uh, at least two polymers or copolymers and miscible polymer blend is uh, a mixture of polymers which are homogeneous at molecular level. Remember we talked about uh, while discussing the T g glass transition temperature we discussed that this miscible polymer blend has uh, a single T g basically they are molecularly soluble with each other. So, they are homogeneous at molecular level and gives energy of mixing for this type of blends is negative. So, they are thermodynamically miscible. Immiscible polymer blends where the individual polymer components are phase separated. So, they are thermodynamically immiscible the delta G mixing is positive. Now, for a application point of view immiscible polymer blend is, uh, is not useful because then what happened during processing they delaminate from each other because they are not miscible at all they come out and you have a delamination problem the one layer comes out. Whereas, miscible polymer blend is not also desirable from uh, in practical point of view because if it is a miscible then you get a property which is a uh, average of those two homopolymers. So, you do not get best of the two polymers um, um, which are mixed uh, for making the blends. So, it is always preferred to make blends which are uh, partially miscible or compatible which we say we use the term compatible where the individual phases of those uh, polymers are maintained, but the interfaces are, are somewhat compatibilized using compatibilizer like block copolymers made up of two different uh, homopolymers. So, basically interface between those two uh, phases are stitched, so that they are not immiscible to, to that extent that they delaminate, but they are not also miscible. So, uh, you can get the best properties of those two polymers as well. So, we talked about compatible polymer blend and polymer alloys are basically immiscible polymer blends with modified interface. Now, if we look at the thermodynamics of um, mixing, we discussed that Flory Huggins, uh, Flory Huggins uh, theory. or polymer solubility and where you have seen that entropy of mixing is given by k t n 1 ln phi 1 n 2 ln phi 2. Remember we did this expression and this is this was for polymer solution where n 1 is the number of molecules of component 1 n 2 is for component 2 and phi 1 and phi 2 are the volume fraction of first component and second component. Now, if we increase the molecular weight, if we increase the molecular weight of a polymer what happened? This number of molecules comes down. So, the entropy of mixing contributes less and less to the mixing gives free energy. So, if you have very high molecular weight then the entropy of mixing is basically negligible. So, the high molecular weights blends or the polymer mixing is not entropy driven. So, it is basically the enthalpy of mixing what determines whether two polymers will be miscible or not. So, if entropy of mixing as uh, enthalpy of mixing is negative enough then the polymers will make miscible blend and if, if they are even 0 then also because of slight entropic contribution they may form miscible polymer blend, but if this is positive then obviously this will form 
immiscible polymer blend. Now, to have a negative value of enthalpy of mixing, there should be some specific interaction between the polymers, and those specific interaction are uh, shown here. Some of them are uh, this hydrogen bonding, ionic interactions, or electron donor acceptor complex uh, type. So basically, what I'm what we need to know that uh, because of the high molecular weight of polymers, uh, the entropy of mixing is not contributing significantly to the Gibbs energy mixing. So, it is basically the enthalpy of mixing which enthalpy of mixing which uh, determines whether a polymer will a blend will form a miscible blend or not. This will be clear with a few example. Let us talk about uh, two molecules decan and substitute methyl substitute decan like 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 pentamethyl decans. Now, if you mix these two molecules, they will mix it easily, no problem. Okay. But similar polymers like polyethylene, if you increase this chain long enough it will make polyethylene and if you increase the chain both sides long enough it will make polypropylene, but they do not mix in mix they do not make miscible blend. Because this there is no specific interaction between these two polymer their enthalpy of mixing is not negative and because they are of high poly high, they are high molecular weight their entropy of mixing is not contributing enough to the Gibbs energy of mixing. So, they form immiscible blends. Another example we can talk about say bisphenol A polycarbonate and polymethyl methacrylate. If the length or the molecular weight of polymethyl methacrylate is high then they do they do not form miscible blend. Whereas, this to form miscible blend as long as the molecular weight of PMA is small like oleomer. So, as we increase the molecular weight the solubility or miscibility between two polymers come down unless there is a specific interaction which makes the enthalpy of mixing negative which happens here like polyethylene oxide and polystyrene because of presence of aromatic rings they can do pi stang interaction between them and because of this specific interaction they form their enthalpy of mixing is negative and as a result they form as a result they form miscible blend. So, basically to form miscible blend the molecular weight has to be low and which is not a practical. So, for polymers which are having high molecular weight mixing is always governed by enthalpy of mixing and that has to become that negative there must be a specific interaction with like hydrogen bonding or pi pi stacking or ionic interaction between the um, two polymer molecules. Now, reason for blending as we quickly as we have just mentioned this improvement with for the base polymer development broad property range of material dilute of high cost engineering resins and so on. So, let us uh, uh, we have discussed it enough uh, earlier. We can blend by just by mechanical mixing uh, we can do solution mixing as well we can dissolve those two polymer in a co-solvent and then form a flame after that and we can make a interpenetrating network uh, by dissolving one polymer in mo another monomer and then polymerizing the monomer to make a polymer which will make this as an interpenetrating network. Okay, Let us uh, come to the last uh, very end of this course and I just want to make few concluding remark. Now, this is uh, the polymer tree where basically we make polymer from monomers and monomer has to be characterized uh, very well by all analytical technique to make sure that uh, they are free of impurities because if there are impurities in the monomer they will be carried over to the polymers and they are very detrimental for the use of the polymers. Once you make the polymer we have 
we basically understood what the different polymerization mechanism like step growth mechanism, chain growth mechanism and different specific technique polymerization technique we studied them in detail and once the polymerization is formed we have uh, learned how to characterize those polymer both from a chemical point of view chemical characterization and determine their molecular weight their the solution behavior their morphology their thermal behavior whether they are crystalline crystalline or amorphous so that all we we discussed how to characterize a polymer completely one the polymer characterizing is over you go through the processing step and finally make the product for the more processing step we need to know few information about uh, the polymers and we have not uh, studied the processing part in detail but what i have done i gave you uh, the basic polymer uh, processing technique uh, which you must know to uh, be understand the polymer uh, completely and in, then we last few lectures we discussed uh, the applications of polymer in the sense that the different polymer properties and how they are evaluated like mechanical properties thermal mechanics and so on so do we discussed in so as a polymer chemist you be very efficient in first two step uh, monomer characterization, monomer synthesis and then polymerization process and characterization, characterization of the polymer sportive synthesis. The, as a polymer chemist you probably have, do, not, do not have to do uh, the processing part or the characterization part, but then you must know the techniques by which the process processing is done or the techniques or different properties and importantly the structure property relationship between the property and the chemical structure unless you do not know the structure property relationship between the property which will enable the polymer to be at, at the final application you cannot design new polymers. Last uh, Leap. We just let go back and look, go back and look at the big picture, a bird's eye view of the polymers. Polymers are applied uh, when they are made. They are made in a solution or in bulk. They are they are synthesized in solution polymerization. They can be synthesized in bulk, uh, like in milk condensation polymerization. Polymers are also can be procured though very uh, very less quantity from natural resources and these polymers are formed from monomers by polymerization different polymerization techniques. What are the source of these raw materials monomers mainly they are from petroleum sources. So, current tent one of the important train or requirement for polymer chemist at presence to find out natural sources because petroleum sources will be over soon or sooner or later not only that petroleum sources the polymers made up of petroleum sources actually causes lots of environmental problem like greenhouse gas emission and so on. So, as a polymer chemist the challenge the current challenge is to make polymers the good which have uh, good properties for uh, application to be able to find application how they are how they can be made from monomers which are sourced from natural sources. We talked about additives and uh, which will be added uh, during compounding or processing and we get uh, either the intermediate products which uh, are sold in market or we can get uh, the simple shaped final product like sheets, film, etcetera. And 
some of the um, and some of some will take this uh, resins in plates or granular form and then make the other uh, additives to make the final part. Now, after making the polymer product, what will what is the fate of the polymer? This is again another very um, contemporary topic of polymer waste. You know, lots of governments are uh, banning plastics, plastics bags mainly because the waste it generates are not degradable, and so basically they they create lots of environmental hazards. So, waste management of polymeric materials is a very important step and like the one where polymers are need to be synthesized or produced from natural sources. Again, this is another contemporary very important topic for a polymer researcher that what happened after? So, so new researcher uh, researcher should focus on to make uh, efficient waste management of the the polymers which are used for different application. If they can be made biodegradable, that's fine. If they are not able, they are not biodegradable. Then if based whether they can be recyclable again to meaningful product or if they are not biodegradable or recyclable then how they the waste can be uh, managed. So, that is uh, one of the very important questions for polymer chemists at this moment. And obviously, nowadays polymers are finding newer and newer applications not uh, polymers are not only applied for the commodity applications, the polymers are now uh, getting or finding applications very, very uh, high end products, especially also in uh, the healthcare related products. So, with this, I come to the conclusion of this course and uh, thank you uh, for being with me with this course and good luck to you. And I leave my email address in case you need to contact with me for any reason. Thank you.